The penalty report following the Vegas race is out. We'll talk about the Bubba Wallace penalty and if it follows precedent. Plus, we have silly season news for 2023 to discuss for Xfinity and for Cup. Let's get to it. This episode of Above the Yellow Line is delivered to you by DoorDash. Hey everyone, welcome back to Above the Yellow Line, the show where we talk all about the NASCAR Cup Series. As I teased that we're going to be talking a little bit more about Xfinity as well as we have some silly season news to break, plus the penalty report, we're going to be talking about the Bubba Wallace penalty following the Vegas race, plus previewing the next race at Homestead Miami. So let's get to it, starting with down the line, talking about key storylines from the past week in the sport, starting with the Kyle Busch penalty following a loose tire at Vegas. Unfortunately for Kyle Busch, his crew did not get the tire on tight enough as he was leaving pit road and went onto the track. The tire came off. This means a four-race suspension for the crew chief and for two crew members from that Kyle Busch team. The question I got on Twitter was, okay, there's only three races left in the season and Kyle Busch isn't going to be with that car. So what does this penalty mean? What will it look like? Well, the tire was put on by the crew, not by Kyle Busch. So the crew members are going to be suspended for four races. This means that that suspension will carry over to 2023 and they will not be able to participate in the LA clash. So for whoever's going to be in that 18 car, they're not going to have that full team with them as there is going to be a suspension up until that race after the clash. Everyone will be back together if there's not a tire that is lost at the clash. So fingers crossed in that case scenario for that 18 team, but Kyle Busch is going to move over to the eight car. He's going to have a full team. So that is what is up for the Kyle Busch penalty following Vegas. Now we got to go into the big story talking about Bubba Wallace's penalty following the Vegas race. NASCAR announced that Bubba Wallace will be suspended from the race at Homestead Miami Speedway this coming week, and John Hunter Nemechek will take over in the 45 car. Starting with the statement from Bubba Wallace, he apologized to everyone in Toyota, TRD, Christopher Bell, Joe Gibbs Racing, 2311 Racing, his partners. The one thing missing from that apology was an apology to the five team. I thought that was very interesting overall, though a very nice statement from Bubba said he would learn from this. 2311 Racing also released a statement following the announcement of the suspension for one race. They said that what Bubba Wallace did did not meet their core values. It also didn't meet their partner's core values. They agreed with NASCAR and understood that there needed to be a severe penalty for this action, understanding the safety concerns as well. So they agreed with the penalty. For me, that's all that matters. As long as the team agrees, NASCAR agrees. I mean, that's not necessarily all that matters, but both parties are in agreement. Bubba Wallace will be suspended. Now, talking about John Hunter Nemechek, this is a big opportunity for him. Obviously, he was cup racing a few years ago, then went out of it. So this will be a good test to see what he can do in the next-gen equipment. Obviously, anyone who moves up is going to be dealing with a different car, whether they've been in the Cup Series before or not. So I'm curious to see how he does in that 45 car. The equipment in that car, I don't know how it compares to the 23 car, but we've seen Bubba Wallace do really, really well in that 45 equipment. So I'm curious to see how John Hunter Nemechek will do, especially because, in my opinion, he's the future of the Toyota development program since drivers are moving around, moving to Chevy. So very curious to see how he will do. I wish the best for him as he fills in for a Bubba Wallace. The question of the day, was this penalty too harsh and does it follow precedent? A little bit of yes or no, I will start off by saying my opinion, I do agree with the penalty given past events. Obviously though this year the precedent has not been held up, we'll talk about that in a second, but I think it's important to note what penalty options were involved in this and what led NASCAR to that decision. So there are four options for an intentional wreck or spin by another driver to another. Those options are as follows. The first option is a monetary and points fine. Notice, it is an and, not an and or. After the Byron penalty with Denny Hamlin, NASCAR went in and changed the rule book, so you now have a points and a monetary fine. The second option is a race suspension. Third option is indefinite suspension. And the fourth and final option is termination. So those are your four penalty options that NASCAR waved around thinking of the Bubba Wallace incident at Vegas. The question now becomes precedent. So I'm reminded of an incident in 2011 between Kyle Busch and Ron Hornaday Jr. Kyle Busch and Ron Hornaday, well, I guess Ron ran Kyle Busch up the track. They made contact. Kyle Busch clearly wasn't happy about it. There was a caution and under caution. Kyle Busch ran Ron Hornaday Jr. into the wall face first and he was called to the NASCAR hauler immediately and black flagged from the race. He was out for the rest of the Texas Motor Speedway weekend and after that race, NASCAR announced that he was suspended from the following race. So that was an instance where there wasn't an altercation on the track or after the race between the two drivers. It was just specifically an on-track incident with an intentional wrecking. That also leads to the question of, okay, there was intentional wreck under caution. 
Why wasn't Byron penalized the same way? For me, I look at it as severity and the speeds at which the drivers were racing. And I understand, we all have to understand this, it is a case-by-case -case basis. I do not envy NASCAR at all for making these decisions, but they have to take into consideration the speed of the track, where we were, what was the cause, and all these other factors going into it. So for that, I can say I understand why NASCAR didn't necessarily follow precedent when looking at the Byron and Hamlin situation. But then this season alone, like I mentioned earlier, NASCAR didn't follow the precedent when we looked at Noah Gregson versus Sage Karam. We talked about this on Monday, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on this, but the differences I saw between that wreck versus what we saw with Bubba Wallace is there was not an altercation following the wreck between the two drivers. There was no disobeying safety concerns or safety orders given by the safety team going out to the track assessing the accident. So that's where the difference is there, and obviously the speeds at which this happened was also different in the Gregson incident versus the Wallace incident. All this to say, I think NASCAR took the extra step because of the altercation that happened after the crash, because of safety concerns with this car. So I think NASCAR was valid in suspending Bubba Wallace. That's that's my opinion. I also think that NASCAR did technically follow precedent, just not the precedent of this year, which I think is why we're all getting caught up. And again, I want to preface this by saying I say this all as a Bubba Wallace fan. You see around me, I have Bubba Wallace merch. I love him. But I do have to agree with NASCAR on this. I think this was a call for suspension. Bubba Wallace did say in a statement too that sometimes his passion can take over, some of his frustration can take over, and it leads to some questionable decisions is how I kind of took his statement there. So very interesting. I will say though too, something else we have to realize is NASCAR is making new precedents this year. This is not the only instance where we feel like a new precedent is being made. For example, the tire penalties, they're a lot tougher this year. I know some of them are on a case by case basis as well. I think it was between Christopher Bell and Austin Cindric. Cindric had a tire roll away completely and that was concerned for a penalty. I think Bell, this was probably a different driver this year, so correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but Bell had another tire leave his pit stall and it wasn't a penalty because it didn't interfere with other pit stops, etc. Whatever you may call it. So there's also some wishy-washy calls there too, but they are on a case-by-case -case basis. Other precedents is the Cole Custer penalty that we had a few weeks ago. The penalty cuts the line between what's helping your teammate and what is manipulating the result of a race. To me, they're kind of the same thing, but NASCAR is trying to draw that line. So there are new precedents being made. And the issue I'm going to have with this penalty, though I agree with it, is if there is a similar situation in the future, if the precedent is not followed, that is when I think I'm going to get a little upset, and I think you all as well. But for now, I agree with the penalty. What do you think, though? Let me know in the comments below. I hope I broke it down enough to give you both sides of the argument here. I understand where a lot of you are coming from saying either this should be harsher or this is way too harsh, and some of you are maybe right on the money along with me. So what do you all think? Let me know in the comments below. But let's move on to some silly season rumors and news. All right, starting with our Cup Series Silly Season news, it was announced by Spyro Motorsports. Their 2023 driver lineup, Corey LaJoy, will continue with that team with his crew chief. And then in the 77 car, we will have Ty Dillon, as expected, will be joining their team full-time. So both cars are now full-time. The 77 is no longer a part-time deal. Very excited for Ty Dillon. He's had an up and down career, I would say, going from place to place hasn't really been stable. Obviously, 2021, he was not in the Cup Series, came back this year with a deal with Petty GMS, leaving that team this year and then going to another team next year with Spire. I hope this is a permanent opportunity for him. I think him and Corey LaJoy make a really interesting team. I don't know if their personalities match, but at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter. It just matters as to what he's able to bring to the team, and I think he's able to bring a lot. Spire Motorsports is definitely growing their program, growing in strength. We saw this a lot this year with Corey LaJoy and how well he's been able to do. So I'm really excited for this lineup, excited to see what Ty Dillon can do in this car, and I hope he does well. So Ty Dillon, Corey LaJoy, that is your lineup at Spire Motorsports in 2023. Final news of the day, silly season regarding Junior Motorsports and the Xfinity Series. Josh Berry announced that he is signing on for another year at Junior Motorsports. He will be there full time in 2023. So now the lineup is set with Junior Motorsports. We got Sam Mayer, Justin Allgaier, Brandon Jones, and Josh Berry. I have my Josh Berry cars out here just to celebrate that. Obviously coming off of a win at Las Vegas Motor Speedway, so it was a great time to make that announcement. Also, kudos to whoever's running their social media pages because the driver announcement videos have been stellar, at least I think so. So Josh Berry will be returning to Junior Motorsports. Reasonable expectations? I mean, he's locked himself into the championship for this year. I don't know if he's going to win the championship, but we've, we've seen crazy things. Obviously, he's a phenomenal racer. I wouldn't be shocked if he did, but just based on how this season has gone for his teammate Noah Grayson, 
I'm leaning towards Gregson to win this year, but I think he's still a contender. He could definitely pull it out this year. I think next year, too, staying at Junior Motorsports, he is a threat for the title, as always. So Josh Berry, excited to see him back at Junior Motorsports for his second full-time season with the team. That is it for NASCAR news today. Obviously, if we have any more news that comes out this week, we will talk about it on the live stream on Friday evening at 9.05 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to have a driver joining us this Friday. I'll announce that at the end of this video. But for now, let's go to our preview of the Dixie Vodka 400 at Homestead Miami Speedway, starting with your track facts and driver stats. The race length is 267 laps or 400.5 miles long. The track length is 1.5 miles and our stage lengths are 80 laps, 85 laps, and 102 laps. Now on to your driver stats. We were last at Homestead Miami in 2021, so your 2021 winner was William Byron. The active driver with the most track wins is Denny Hamlin with three wins. The active driver with the best average finish at the track with only two starts is Tyler Reddick with an average finishing position of three. However, if we are looking at a driver with over five starts with the best average finish, that driver is Kevin Harvick with an average finishing position of 7.3. Next up, the team with the most track wins is Joe Gibbs Racing with eight wins. And finally, the wins by manufacturer. Chevrolet has six, Ford has eight, and Toyota has six. All of this from driveraverages.com. Finally, let's close it out with our guys to watch and to worry about who should be in your fantasy lineup and maybe somebody you should pump the brakes on this weekend. Let's start with our guys that I'm going to worry about, maybe won't put in my fantasy lineup. First guy we got to talk about is Ross Chastain. His stats at this track are not good. He has the worst average finishing position of all the drivers in the playoffs right now with a 28.3 average finishing position. Not very good. So Rosh Hussain is going to be a guy that I'm going to be pausing on this weekend. Final guy I'm going to be worried about is Ryan Blaney. He's also not really good at this track. His only top 10 finish in his seven starts at this track was in 2020 where he finished third. Every other finishing position was outside the top 10. That says a lot for me about Ryan Blaney at this track. I feel, feel like there's no need to waste a pick on him this weekend in your fantasy lineup, so I would keep him out. Also very concerned as he's below the cutoff line going into this race. I feel like that's going to hurt his chances, so Ryan Blaney, keep out of your fantasy lineup too, but I'm going to be worried about him and Ross Chastain. Now for our guys to watch. Should have prefaced this all by saying that we've not been to this track with a Gen 7 car, so these are my predictions as to what could happen, but obviously we don't have data to back this up quite yet, but based on past precedent, we're going to bring that up again, here is what I think will happen with our guys to watch. I think Denny Hamlin is a shoe-in to probably win this race. Last one he had at this track was in 2020. He has the most wins at this track as well. I feel like this is one of the tracks, besides Martinsville, coming up after this race, where he could punch his way into the championship four. If he doesn't, I will be shocked because these are two of his best tracks right here. So Denny Hamlin, one of our guys to watch. Then I'm going to be looking at Christopher Bell. He has the ninth best average finishing position amongst the active drivers. So not in the top five, so maybe not that great. But another thing to consider too is last year his first time in Joe Gibbs racing equipment he finished third in this race so I would expect some great things out of him this weekend he's below the cutoff line he needs a win so he might be the guy to do that also if I'm going to add another guy to this list Chase Briscoe he's one of this track in Xfinity he has good stats and his team is on a roll or at least they're very scrappy they're hungry to get them into the championship four based off of what we saw last weekend with him being not a contender to win the race at all to a contender I think he has a shot this weekend at Homestead. So I guess this weekend, instead of two drivers to watch, I'm going to be looking at three drivers to watch. Those are Hamlin, Bell, and Briscoe. Closing it out before we move on, do you have any final thoughts on the Bubba Wallace incident? Who do you have to watch to worry going into Miami? Let me know in the comments below. And with that, we are done with this episode of Above the Yellow Line, the show where we talk all about the NASCAR Cup Series. Alrighty, I teased this in the middle of the video, but I am excited to announce that we have scheduled Ryan Vargas to be on the stream with us this Friday. So make sure to tune in to give us your questions, comments, concerns, and just to join us for an overall great conversation while the rest of the ATYL crew takes a vacation this week. So I am thrilled to have Ryan Vargas on the stream and we hope that you tune in and join us as well. So to hear more about that stream, just Autonomia Awareness Month, because that's still happening, and to hear more from us at Above the Yellow Line, make sure you follow us on social media at underscore Taylor Kitchen underscore on Twitter and Above the Yellow Line on Instagram, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Also make sure to follow Toby Christie Com on all social media platforms to find great motorsports content and also look at our website, tobychristie.com as well. Last but not least, I want to give a huge thank you to DoorDash for supporting ATYL and TobyChristie.com. Make sure you use the promo code NASCAR30 to get 30% off your first DoorDash order. 
You can find all of our social links in the description below, but before you check those out, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, share this with your friends and family, and guys, thank you so much for supporting us here at Above the Low Line and tobychristy.com, and until next time, we'll see ya.